Section 32 of the Hawaiian Archipelago by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Letter 31. Hawaiian Hotel Honolulu, August the 6th. My fate is lying at the wharf in the shape of the Pacific Mail steamer Costa Rica, and soon, to me, Hawaii Nei will be but a dream. Summer Isles of Eden. My heart warms towards them as I leave them, for they have been more like home than any part of the world since I left England. The moonlight is trickling through misty algarobas and feathery tamarinds and palms, and shines on glossy leaves of breadfruit and citron. A cool breeze brings in at my open doors the perfumed air and the soft murmur of the restful sea. And this beautiful Honolulu, whose lights are twinkling through the purple night, is, at last, as it was at first, paradise in the Pacific, a bright blossom of a summer sea. I shall be in the Rocky Mountains before you receive my hastily written reply to your proposal to come out here for a year, but I will add a few reasons against it, in addition to the one which I gave regarding the benefit which I now hope to derive from a change to a more stimulating climate. The strongest of all is that if we were to stay here for a year, we should just sit down between the sun and moon upon the shore and forget our island home and be content to fall asleep in a half-dream and return no more. Of course, you will have gathered from my letters that there are very many advantages here. Indeed, the mosquitoes of the leeward coast, to whose attacks one becomes inured in a few months, are the only physical drawback. The open-air life is most conducive to health, and the climate is absolutely perfect, owing to its equability and purity. Whether the steady heat of Honolulu, the languid airs of Hilo, the balmy breezes of Onomea, the cool bluster of Waimea, or the odorous stillness of Kona, it is always the same. The grim gloom of our anomalous winters, the harsh malignant winds of our springs, and the dismal rains and overpowering heats of our summers have no counterpart in the endless springtime of Hawaii. Existence here is unclogged and easy, a small income goes a long way, and the simplicity, refinement, kindness and sociability of the foreign residents render society very pleasant. The life here is truer, simpler, kinder and happier than ours. The relation between the foreign and native population is a kindly and happy one, and the natives, in spite of their faults, are a most friendly and pleasant people to live among. With a knowledge of their easily acquired language, they would be a ceaseless source of interest, and every white resident can have the satisfaction of helping them in their frequent distresses and illnesses. The sense of security is a very special charm, and one enjoys it as well in lonely native houses and solitary days and nights of travelling, as in the foreign homes, which are never locked throughout the year. There are no burglarious instincts to dread, and there is no such thing as a broken sleep of fear beneath the stars. The person and property of a white man are everywhere secure, and a white woman is sure of unvarying respect and kindness. There are no inevitable hardships. The necessaries and even the luxuries of civilization can be obtained everywhere and postal communication with America is now regular and rapid. When I began this letter, a long procession of counterbalancing disadvantages passed through my mind, but they become beautifully less as I set them down in black and white. If I put gossip first, it is because I seriously think that it is the canker of the foreign society on the islands. Its extent and universality are grotesque and amusing to a stranger, but to live in it and share in it and learn to enjoy it would be both lowering and hurtful. 
and you can hardly be long here without being drawn into its vortex. By gossip, I don't mean scandal or malignant misrepresentations, or reports of pretty strifes, intrigues and jealousies, such as are common in all cliques and communities. But new whole, mere tattle, the perpetual talking about people, and the picking to tatters of every item of personal detail, whether gathered from fact or imagination. A great deal of this is certainly harmless, and in some measure arises from the intimate friendly relations which exist between the scattered families. But overindulgence in it destroys the privacy of individual existence, and is deteriorating in more ways than one. From the north of Kauai to the south of Hawaii, everybody knows every other body's affairs, income, expenditure, sales, purchases, debts, furniture, clothing, comings, goings, borrowings, lendings, letters, correspondence, and everything else. And when there is nothing new to relate on any one of these prolific subjects, Supposed intentions afford abundant matter for speculation. All gossip is focused here, being imported from every other district and re-exported, with additions and embellishments, by every inter-island mail. The ingenuity with which New Hull is circulated is worthy of a better cause. Some disadvantages arise from the presence on the islands of heterogeneous and ill-assorted nationalities. The Americans, of course, predominate, and even those who are Hawaiian-born have, as elsewhere, a strongly national feeling. The far smaller English community hangs together in a somewhat cliquish fashion and possibly cherishes a latent grudge against the Americans for their paramount influence in island affairs. The German residents, as everywhere, are cliquish too. Then, since the establishment of the Honolulu mission, church feeling has run rather high, and here, as elsewhere, has a socially divisive tendency. Then there are drink and anti-drink, pro- and anti-missionary, and pro- and anti-reciprocity treaty parties, and various other local naggings of no interest to you. The civilization is exotic, and owing to various circumstances, the government and constitution are too experimental and provisional in their nature, and possess too few elements of permanence to engross the profound interest of the foreign residents, although for reasons of policy they are well inclined to sustain a barbaric throne. In spite of a king and court, and titles and officials without number, and uniforms stiff with gold lace, and royal dinner parties with menus printed on white silk, Americans, Republicans in feeling, really run the government, and in state affairs there is a taint of that combination of obsequious and flippant vulgarity, which none deplore more deeply than the best among the Americans themselves. It is a decided misfortune to a community to be divided in its national leanings and to have no great fusing interests within or without itself, such as those which knit vigorous Victoria to the mother country or distant Oregon to the heart of the Republic at Washington. Except sugar and dollars, one rarely hears any subject spoken about with general interest, the downfall of an administration in England, or any important piece of national legislation, arouses almost no interest in American society here, and the English are ostentatiously apathetic regarding any piece of intelligence specially absorbing to Americans. The papers pick up every piece of gossip which drifts about the islands and snarl with much wordiness over local matters, but crowd into a small space the movements which affect the masses of mankind, and in the absence of a telegraph one hardly feels the beat of the pulses of the larger world. Those intellectual movements of the West, which might provoke discussion and conversation, are not cordially entered into. 
partly owing to the difference in theological beliefs, and partly from an indolence born of the climate and the lack of mental stimulants. After all, the gossip and the absence of large interests shared in common are the only specialties which can be alleged against Hawaii, and I have never seen people among whom I should so well like to live. The ladies are most charming, essentially womanly, and fulfil all domestic and social duties in a way worthy of imitation everywhere. The kindness and hospitality, too, are unbounded, and these cover a multitude of sins. There are very few strangers here now. It is the dead season. I have met with none except Mr Nordhoff, who is writing on the islands for Harper's Monthly, and his charming wife and children. She is a most expert horsewoman, and has adopted the Mexican saddle even in Honolulu, where few foreign ladies ride cavalier fashion. My friends all urge me to write on Hawaii, on the ground that I have seen the islands and lived the island life so thoroughly. But possibly they expect more indiscriminate praise than I could conscientiously bestow. Honolulu is in the midst of the epidemic of letter writing which sets in on the arrival of the steamer from the coast and people walk and drive as if they really had business on hand. And the farewell visits to be made and received, the pleasant presence of Mr. Thompson, and Mr. and Mrs. Severance of Hilo, and the hasty doing of things which have been left to the last, make me a sharer in the spasmodic bustle, which, were it permanent, would metamorphose this dreamy, bowery, tropical capital. The undeserved and unexpected kindness shown me here, as everywhere on these islands, renders my last impressions even more delightful than any first. The people are as genial as their own sunny skies, and in more frigid regions I shall never sigh for the last without longing for the first. Up to here. SS Costa Rica, August the 7th. We sailed for San Francisco early this afternoon. Everything looked the same as when I landed in January, except that many of the then strange faces among the radiant crowd are now the faces of friends, that I know nearly everyone by sight, and that the pathos of farewell blended with every look and word. The air still rang with laughter and alohas, and the rippling music of the Hawaiian tongue. Bananas and pineapples were still piled in fragrant heaps. The drifts of surf rolled in as then, over the barrier reef. Canoes without riggers still poised themselves on the blue water. The coral divers still plied their graceful trade. And the lazy ripples still flashed in light along the palm-fringed shore. The head ropes were let go. We steamed through the violet channel into the broad Pacific. Luna Lilo, who came out so far with Chief Justice Allen, returned to the shore, and when his kindly aloha was spoken, the last link with the islands was severed, and half an hour later, Honolulu was out of sight. The breeze is freshening, and the Costa Rica's head lies nearly due north. The sun is sinking, and on the far horizon the summit peaks of Oahu gleam like amethysts on a golden sea. Farewell forever, my bright tropic dream. Aloha nui to Hawaii nei. I.L.B. End of section. Section 33 of the Hawaiian Archipelago by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A chapter on Hawaiian affairs. A few facts concerning the Hawaiian Islands may serve to supplement the deficiencies of the foregoing letters. The group is an hereditary and constitutional monarchy. 
there is a House of Nobles appointed by the Crown, which consists of 20 members. The House of Representatives consists of not less than 24, or more than 40, members elected biennially. The legislature fixes the number and apportions the same. The Houses sit together and constitute the Legislative Assembly. The property qualification for a representative is real estate worth $500 or an annual income of $250 from property, and that for an elector is an annual income of $75. The legislators are paid, and the expense of a session is about $15,000. There are three cabinet ministers appointed by the Crown, of the Interior, Finance and Foreign Affairs, respectively, and an Attorney General who may be regarded as a Minister of Justice. There is a Supreme Court with a Chief Justice and two Associate Justices, and there are circuit and district judges on all the larger islands, as well as sheriffs, prisons and police. There is a standing army of 60 men, mainly for the purposes of guard duty and rendering assistance to the police. The question of how to make ends meet sorely exercises the little kingdom. All sorts of improvements involving a largely increased outlay are continually urged, while at the same time the burden of taxation presses increasingly heavily and there is a constant clamour for the removal of some of the most lucrative imposts. Indeed, the Hawaiian dog with his tax and his tag is seldom out of the Legislative Assembly. What may be termed the per capita taxes are an annual poll tax of one dollar levied on each male inhabitant between the ages of 17 and 60, an annual road tax of $2 upon all persons between 17 and 50, and an annual school tax of $2 upon all persons between 21 and 60. There is a direct tax upon property of half a percent upon its valuation, and specific taxes of a dollar on every horse above two years old, and a dollar and a half on each dog. Of the $206,000 raised by internal taxes during the last biennial period, the horses paid $50,000, the mules $6,000, and the dogs $19,000. The indirect taxation in the shape of customs duties amounted to $350,000 in the same period. The poor Hawaiian does not know the blessing of a free breakfast table. The islands are large importers. The value of imported goods paying duties was $1,437,000 in 1873, on which the Hawaiian Treasury received $198,000 as customs duties. $25,000 worth of ale, porter and light wines, and $30,000 worth of spirits show that the foreign population of 6,000 is more than sufficiently bibulous. The Chinamen, about 2,000 in number, are, or ought to be, responsible for $13,000 worth of opium, and the $34,000 worth of tobacco and cigars is doubtless distributed pretty equally over all the nationalities. 21,000 gallons of spirits were imported in 1873. The licences to sell spirits brought $18,000 into the Treasury in the last biennial period, but those for the sale of avar and opium brought in $55,000 during the same time. These licences are confined to Honolulu. There are two interesting items of customs receipts, a sum of $924, the proceeds of a per capita tax of $2, levied on passengers landing on the islands for the support of the Queen's Hospital, and a sum of $1,477, the proceeds of a tax levied on seamen for the support of the Marine Hospital. There is a sum of $700 for passports. 
as no Hawaiian or stranger can leave the kingdom without an official permit. There are 58 vessels registered under the Hawaiian flag, of which 40 are coasters and 18 engaged in foreign freighting and whaling. The value of domestic exports in 1873 was $1,725,507. Among these are bananas, pineapples, pulu, coconuts, oranges, limes, sandalwood, tamarinds, betel leaves, shark's fins, paiai, whale oil, sperm oil, coconut oil, and whalebone. Among other commodities that were exported, of coffee, 262,000 pounds, of fungus, 57,000 pounds, of peanuts, 58,000 pounds, of cotton, 8,000 pounds, of rice, 941,000 pounds, of paddy, 507,000 pounds, of hides, 20,000 packages, of goat skins, 66,000, of horns, 13,000, and of tallow, 609,000 pounds. The expense of keeping things going on the islands for the two years ending March the 1st, 1874, amounted to $1,193,276. But this included the funeral expenses of two kings, as well as of two extra sessions of the legislature, which amounted to $42,000. The decrease in the revenue for the same period amounted to $45,000. The items of Hawaiian expenditure were as follows. For civil list... $47,689.73. $47,689.73. Permanent settlements, Queen Emma, 12000 Legislature and Privy Council, $15,288.50. Extra legislative expenses, $19,011.87. Department of the Judiciary, $72,245.64 Department of Foreign Affairs and War $78,145.85 Department of the Interior $389,009.08 Department of Finance $202,117.05 Department of the Attorney General, $97,097. Bureau of Public Instruction, $89,432.40. Miscellaneous Expenditures, $170,474.67. The Balance on Hand in the Treasury, March 31st, 1874. $764.57. $764.57. Total, $1,193,276.36. That, under the head finance, includes the interest on borrowed money. The funded national debt is 340000 Of this sum, a portion bears no stated interest, only such as may arise from the very dubious profits of the Hawaiian Hotel. The interest charges are 12% on $25,000 and 9% on $272,000. The estimates for the present biennial period involve a large increase of debt. The present financial position of the kingdom is an increasing expenditure and a decreasing revenue. The statistics of the Judiciary Department for the last two years present a few features of interest. There were 4,000 convictions out of 5,764 cases brought before the courts, equal to a 14th part of the population. The total number of offences in the category is 125. Of these, some are decidedly local. Thus, for furnishing intoxicating liquors to Hawaiians, 92 persons were punished. For exhibition of hula, 10. For selling eva without licence, 
12. For selling opium without licence, 24. It is not surprising to those who know the habits of the people that the convictions for violations of the marriage tie, though greatly diminished, should reach the number of 384, while under the head deserting husbands and wives, 67 convictions are recorded. For practising medicine without a licence, 56 persons were punished. For furious riding, 197. For cruelty to animals, 37. For gaming, 121. For gross cheating, 32. For violating the Sabbath, 61. We must remember that the returns include foreigners and Chinamen, or else the reputation for harmlessness which Hawaiians possess would suffer seriously when we read that within the last two years there were 178 convictions for assault, 248 for assault and battery, 12 for assaults with dangerous weapons, 49 for affray, 674 for drunkenness, 87 for disturbing quiet of the night, and 13 for murder. Yet the number of criminal cases has largely diminished, and taking civil and criminal together, there has been a decrease of 656 for the last biennial period, as compared with that immediately preceding it. The administration of justice is confessedly one of the most efficient departments of Hawaiian affairs. Chief Justice Allen, both as a lawyer and a gentleman, is worthy to fill the highest position in his native country, America, and the associate justices, as well as the native and foreign judges throughout the islands, are highly esteemed for honour and uprightness. I never heard an uttered suspicion of venality or unfairness against any one of them, and apparently the Judiciary Department of Hawaii deserves the same confidence which we repose in our own. The educational system has been carefully modelled and is carried out with tolerable efficiency. 87% of the whole school population are actually at school, and the inspector of schools states that a person who cannot read and write is rarely met with. Each common school is graded into two, three or four classes, according to the intelligence and proficiency of the pupils, and the curriculum of study is as follows. Class 1. Reading, Mental and Written Arithmetic, Geography, Penmanship and Composition. Class 2. Reading, Mental Arithmetic, Geography, Penmanship. Class 3. Reading, First Principles of Arithmetic, Penmanship. Class 4. Primer, Use of Slate and Pencil. The youngest children are not classified until they can put letters together in syllables. Vocal music is taught wherever competent teachers are found. The total sum expended on education, including the grants to family and other schools, is about 40000 a year. It has been remarked that the rising race of Hawaiians has an increased contempt for industry in the form of manual labour and it is proposed by the Board of Education that such labour shall be made a part of common school education, so that on both girls and boys a desire to provide for their own wants in an honest way shall be officially inculcated. There is a government reformatory school, and industrial and family schools for both girls and boys are scattered over the islands. The supply of literature in the vernacular is meagre, and few of the natives have any intelligent comprehension of English. The group has an area of about four million acres, of which about 200,000 may be regarded as arable, and 150,000 especially adapted for the culture of sugar cane. Sugar, the great staple production, gives employment in its cultivation and manufacture to nearly 4,000 hands. Only a fifteenth part of the estimated arable area is under cultivation. Over 6,000 natives are returned as the possessors of kuleanas, or freeholds, 
but many of these are heavily mortgaged. Many of the larger lands are held on lease from the Crown or Chiefs, and there are difficulties attending the purchase of small properties. Almost all the roots and fruits of the torrid and temperate zones can be grown upon the islands, and the banana, carlo, yam, sweet potato, coconut, breadfruit, arrowroot, sugarcane, strawberry, raspberry, whortleberry, and native apple are said to be indigenous. The indigenous fauna is small, consisting only of hogs, dogs, rats, and an anomalous bat which flies by day. There are few insects except such as have been imported, and these which consist of centipedes, scorpions, cockroaches, mosquitoes and fleas are happily confined to certain localities, and the two first have left most of their venom behind them. A small lizard is abundant, but snakes, toads and frogs have not yet effected a landing. The ornithology of the islands is scanty. Domestic fowls are supposed to be indigenous. Wild geese are numerous among the mountains of Hawaii, and plovers, snipe and wild ducks are found on all the islands. A handsome owl called the owl hawk is common. There is a parrot with purple feathers, another with scarlet, a woodpecker with variegated plumage of red, green and yellow, and a small black bird with a single yellow feather under each wing. There are few singing birds, but one of the few has as sweet a note as that of the English thrush. There are very few varieties of moths and butterflies. The flora of the Hawaiian Islands is far scantier than that of the South Sea groups, and cannot compare with that of many other tropical as well as temperate regions. But all the islands are rich in cryptogamous plants, of which there is an almost infinite variety. Hawaii is still in process of construction, and is subject to volcanic eruptions, earthquakes and tidal waves. Hurricanes are unknown, and thunderstorms are rare and light. Under favourable circumstances of moisture, the soil is most prolific, and patch cultivation in glens and ravines, as well as on mountain sides, produces astonishing results. A carlo patch of 40 square feet will support a man for a year. An acre of favourably situated land will grow a thousand stems of bananas, which will produce annually ten tonnes of fruit. The sweet potato flourishes on the most unpromising lava, where soil can hardly be said to exist, and in good localities produces two hundred barrels to the acre. On dry, light soils, the Irish potato grows anyhow and anywhere with no other trouble than that of planting the sets. Most vegetable dyes, drugs and spices can be raised. Forty diverse fruits present an overflowing cornucopia. The esculents of the temperate zones flourish. The coffee bush produces from three to five pounds of berries the third year after planting. The average yield of sugar is two and a half tonnes to the acre. Pineapples grow like weeds in some districts, and watermelons are almost a drug. The bamboo is known to grow 16 inches in a day. Wherever there is a sufficient rainfall, the earth teems with plenty. Yet the Hawaiian Islands can hardly be regarded as a field for emigration, though nature is lavish and the climate the most delicious and salubrious in the world. Farming as we understand it is unknown. The dearth of insectivorous birds seriously affects the cultivation of a soil naturally bounteous to excess. The narrow gorges in which terraced patch cultivation is so successful offer no temptations to a man with the world before him. The larger areas require labour, and labour is not to be had. Though wheat and other cereals mature, Attacks of weevil prevent their storage, and all the grain and flour consumed are imported from California. 
Cacao, cinnamon and allspice are subject to an apparently ineradicable blight. The blight which has attacked the coffee shrub is so severe that the larger plantations have been dug up and coffee is now raised by patch culture, mainly among the guava scrub which fringes the forests. Oranges suffer from blight also, and some of the finest groves have been cut down. Cotton suffers from the ravages of a caterpillar. The mulberry tree, which from its rapid growth would be invaluable to silk growers, is covered with a black and white blight. Sheep are at present successful, but in some localities the spread of a pestilent oat burr is depreciating the value of their wool. The forests, which are essential to the well-being of the islands, are disappearing in some quarters, owing to the attacks of a grub, as well as the ravages of cattle. Coconuts, bananas, yams, sweet potatoes, carlo and breadfruit, the staple food of the native population, are free from blight, and so are potatoes and rice. Beef cattle can be raised for almost nothing, and in some districts beef can be bought for the cent or two per pound, which pays for the cutting up of the carcass. Everyone can live abundantly and without the sweat of the brow, but few can make money owing to the various forms of blight, the scarcity of labour and the lack of a profitable market. There is little healthy activity in any department of business. The whaling fleet has deserted the islands. A general pelikia prevails. Settlements are disappearing. Valley lands are falling out of cultivation. Hylograss and guava scrub are burying the traces of a former population. The natives are rapidly diminishing, the old industries are abandoned, and the inherent immorality of the race, the great outstanding cause of its decay, still resists the influence of Christian teaching and example. An exotic civilization is having a fair trial on the Hawaiian Islands. With the exception of the serious maladies introduced by foreigners in the early days, and the disastrous moral influence exercised by worthless whites, they have suffered none of the wrongs usually inflicted on the feebler by the stronger race. The rights of the natives were in the first instance carefully secured to them, and have since been protected by equal laws righteously administered. The Hawaiians have been aided towards independence in political matters, and the foreigners, who framed the laws and constitution and have directed Hawaiian affairs, such as Richards, Lee, Judd, Allen and Wiley, were men above reproach. And missionary influence, of all others the most friendly to the natives, has predominated for 50 years. The effects of missionary labour have been scarcely touched upon in the foregoing letters, and here, in preference to giving any opinion of my own, I quote from Mr. R. H. Dana, an Episcopalian and a barrister of the highest standing in America, well known in this country by his writings, who sums up his investigations on the Sandwich Islands in the following dispassionate words. It is no small thing to say of the missionaries of the American board that in less than 40 years, they have taught this whole people to read and to write, to cipher and to sew. They have given them an alphabet, grammar and dictionary, preserved their language from extinction, given it a literature, and translated into it the Bible and works of devotion, science and entertainment, etc. They have established schools, reared up native teachers, and so pressed their work that now the proportion of inhabitants who can read and write is greater than in New England. And whereas they found these islanders a nation of half-naked savages, living in the surf and on the sand, eating raw fish, fighting among themselves, tyrannised over by feudal chiefs and abandoned to sensuality, they now see them decently clothed, 
recognising the law of marriage, knowing something of accounts, going to school and public worship more regularly than the people do at home, and the more elevated of them taking part in conducting the affairs of the constitutional monarchy under which they live, holding seats on the judicial bench and in the legislative chambers and filling posts in the local magistracies. If space permitted, the testimony of Mark Twain given in Roughing It might be added to the above, and the remaining missionaries may well point to the visible results of their labours with the one word, circumspice. End of section. Section 34 of the Hawaiian Archipelago by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A chapter on Hawaiian history. In the prehistoric days of Hawaii, for 500 years as the bards sing, before Captain Cook landed, and indeed for some years afterwards, each island had its king, chiefs, and internal dissensions, and incessant wars, with a reckless waste of human life, kept the whole group in turmoil. Chaotic and legendary as early Hawaiian history is, there is enough to show that there must have been regularly organised communities on the islands for a very long period, with a civilization and polity which, though utterly unworthy of Christianity, were enlightened and advanced for Polynesian heathenism. The kingly office was hereditary, and the king's power absolute. On the different islands, the kings and chiefs, who together constituted a privileged class, admitted the priesthood to some portion of their privileges, probably with the view of enslaving the people more completely through the agency of religion, and held the lower classes in absolute subserviency by the most rigorous of feudal systems, which included hana poalima, or forced labour, and the taboo, well known throughout Polynesia. A very interesting history begins with Kamehameha the Great, the Conqueror or the Terrible, the Napoleon of the Pacific, as he has been called. He united an overmastering ambition to a singular gift of ruling, and without education, training, or the help of a single political president to guide him, animated not only by the lust of conquest, but by the desire to create a nationality, he subjugated everything that his canoes could reach, and fused a rabble of savages and chieftaincies into a united nation, every individual of which to this day inherits something of the patriotism of the conqueror. His wars were by no means puny, either in proportions or slaughter, as, for instance, when he meditated the conquest of Kauai. His expedition included 7,000 picked warriors, 21 schooners, 40 swivels, 6 mortars, and an abundance of ammunition. His victories are celebrated in countless melees, or unwritten songs, which are said to be marked by real poetic feeling and simplicity, and to resemble the Ossianic poems in majesty and melancholy. He founded the dynasty which for seventy years has stood as firmly, and exercised its functions for the welfare of the people, on the whole as efficiently as any other government. The king was forty-five years old, when having no more worlds to conquer, he devoted himself to the consolidation of his kingdom. He placed governors on each island, directly responsible to himself, who nominated chiefs of districts, heads of villages, and all petty officers, and tax-gatherers, who, for lack of the art of writing, kept their accounts by a method in use in the English exchequer in ancient times. He appointed a council of chiefs, with whom he advised on important matters, and a council of wise men, who assisted him in framing laws and in regulating concerns of minor importance. In all matters of national importance, the governors and high chiefs of the islands met with the sovereign in consultations. 
These were conducted with great privacy, and the results were promulgated through the islands by heralds, whose office was hereditary. Kamehameha enacted statutes against theft, murder, and oppression, and although he wielded oppressive and despotic authority himself, his people enjoyed a golden age, as compared with those that were past. The king, governors, and chiefs constituted the magistracy, and there was an appeal from both chiefs and governors to the king. It was usual for both parties to be heard face to face in the enclosure in front of the house of the king or governor. No lawyers were employed, and every man advocated his own cause, sitting cross-legged before the judges. Swiftness and decision characterised the redress of grievances and the administration of justice. Kamehameha reduced the feudal tenure of land, which had heretofore been the theory into absolute practice, claiming for the crown the sole ownership of the land, and dividing it among his followers on the conditions of tribute and military service. The common people were attached to the soil and transferred with it. A chief might nominate his wife or son or any other person to succeed him in his possessions, but at his death they reverted to the king, whose order was required before the testamentary wish became of any value. There were some wise regulations generally applicable concerning the planting of coconut trees, and a law that the water should be conducted over every plantation twice a week in general, and once a week during the dry season. This king constructed immense fish ponds on the sea coast and devoted himself to commerce with such success that in one year he exported $400,000 worth of sandalwood, felled and shipped at the cost of much suffering to the common people, and on finding that a large proportion of the profit had been dissipated by harbour dues at Canton, he took up the idea and established harbour dues at Honolulu. From Vancouver, Kamehameha learned of the grandeur and power of Christian nations, and in the idea that his people might grow great through Christianity, he asked him, in 1794, that Christian teachers might be sent from England. This request, if ever presented, was disregarded, as was another made by Captain Turnbull in 1803 and this exceptionally great Polynesian died the year before the light of the gospel shone on Hawaiian shores. Some persons, it does not appear whether they were English or American, attempted his conversion, but the astute savage, after listening to their eloquent statements of the power of faith, pressed on them as a crucial test to throw themselves from the top of an adjacent precipice, making his reception of their religion contingent on their arrival unhurt at its base. He built large heiaus, amongst others the ones at Kauai Hei, at the dedication of which to his favourite war god, eleven human sacrifices were offered. To the end he remained devoted to the state religion, and the last instances of capital punishment for breaking taboo a thraldom deeply interwoven with the religious system, occurred in the last year of his reign, when one man was put to death for putting on a chief's girdle, another for eating of a tabooed dish, and a third for leaving a house under taboo and entering one which was not so. His last prayers were to his great red-feathered god Kukailimoku, and priests bringing idols crowded round him in his dying agony. His last words were, Move on in my good way, and... In the death room the high chiefs consulted, and one, to testify his great grief, proposed to eat the body raw, but was overruled by the majority. So the flesh was separated from the bones and they were tied up in tapa, and concealed so effectually that they have never since been found. A holocaust of three hundred dogs gave splendour to his obsequies. These are our gods whom I worship, 
he had said to Kotzebue, while showing him one of the temples. Whether I do right or wrong, I do not know, but I follow my faith, which cannot be wicked, as it commands me never to do wrong. Kamehameha the Great died in 1819, and his son, Liholiho, who loved whiskey and pleasure, was peaceably crowned king in his room and by his name. He, with the powerful aid of the queen dowager, Kaahumanu, abolished taboo, and his subjects cast away their idols and fell into indifferent scepticism. The high priest Hewa Hewa, being the last to light the iconoclastic torch, having previously given his opinion that there was only one great Akua or spirit in Lani, the heavens. This Kamehameha II was the king who, with his queen, died of measles in London in 1824, after which the blonde frigate was sent to restore their bodies with much ceremony to Hawaiian soil. Kamehameha III, a minor, another son of the conqueror, succeeded and reigned for thirty years, dividing the lands among the nobles and the people and conferring upon his kingdom an equable constitution. The law officially abolishing idolatry was confirmed by him, and while complete religious toleration otherwise was granted, the Christian faith was established in these words. The religion of the Lord Jesus Christ shall continue to be the established national religion of the Hawaiian Islands. His words on July 31st, 1843, when the English colours, wrongfully hoisted, were lowered in favour of the Hawaiian flag, are the national motto. The life of the land is established in righteousness. In his reign, Hawaiian independence was recognised by Great Britain, France and America. His premier for some time was Mr Wiley, who with a rare devotion and disinterestedness devoted his life and a large fortune to his adopted country. Kamehameha IV, a grandson of the conqueror, succeeded him in 1854. He was a patriotic prince and strove hard to advance the civilization of his people and to arrest their decrease by reformatory and sanitary measures. He was the most accomplished prince of his line, and his death in 1863, soon after that of his only child, the Prince of Hawaii, was very deeply regretted. His widow, Queen Kale Leona Lani, or Emma, visited England after his death. He was succeeded by his brother, a man of a very different stamp, who was buried on January 11, 1873, after a partial outbreak of the orgies, wherewith the natives disgraced themselves after the death of a chief in the old heathen days. It is rare to meet with two people successively who hold the same opinion of Kamehameha V. He was evidently a man of some talent and strong will, intensely patriotic, and determined not to be a merely ornamental figurehead of a government administered by foreigners in his name. He ardently desired the encouragement of foreign immigration and the opening of a free market in America for Hawaiian produce. He ruled as well as reigned, and though he abrogated the Constitution of 1852 and introduced several features of absolutism into the government, on the whole, he seems to have done well by his people. He is said to have been regal and dignified, to have worked hard, to have written correct state papers, and to have been capable of the deportment of an educated Christian gentleman, but to have reimbursed himself for this subservience to conventionality by occasionally retiring to an undignified residence on the seashore, where he transformed himself into the likeness of one of his half-clad heathen ancestors, debased himself by whiskey, and revelled in the hula hula. He is said also to have been so far under the empire of the old superstitions as to consult an ancient witch on affairs of importance. 
He died amidst the rejoicings incident to his birthday, and on the next day lay in state in the throne room of the palace, while his ministers, his staff, and the chiefs of the realm kept watch over him, and sombre kahilis waving at his head beat a rude and silent dead march for the crowds of people, subjects, and aliens, who continuously filed through the apartment for a curious farewell glance at the last of the Kamehameha. His death closed the first era of Hawaiian history and the orderly succession of one recognised dynasty. No successor to the throne had been proclaimed, and the king left no nearer kin and the princess, Kilikolani, his half-sister, a lady not in the line of regal descent. Under these novel circumstances, it devolved upon the legislative assembly to elect by ballot some native alii of the kingdom as successor to the throne. The candidates were the high chief Kala Kaua, the present king, and Prince Luna Lino, the late king. But the well-beloved, as Luna Lilo was called, was elected unanimously, amidst an outburst of popular enthusiasm. From his high resolves and generous instincts, much was expected, and the unhappy failing, to which after the most painful struggles he succumbed, on the solicitation of some bad or thoughtless foreigners, if it lessened him aught in the public esteem, abated nothing of the wonderful love that was felt for him. He died after a lingering illness on February 3, 1874. Although the event had been expected for some time, its announcement was received with profound sorrow by the whole community, while the native subjects of the deceased sovereign, according to ancient custom, expressed their feelings in loud wailing which echoed mournfully through the still red air of early daylight. On the following evening, the body was placed on a shrouded bier and was escorted in solemn procession by the government officials and the late king's staff to the Ayalani Palace, there to lie in state. It was a cloudless moonlight, not a leaf stirred or bird sang, and the crowd, consisting of several thousands, open to the right and left to let the dismal death train pass, in a stillness which was only broken by the solemn tramp of the bearers. The next day the corpse lay in state in all the splendour that the islands could bestow, dressed in the clothes the king wore when he took the oath of office, and resting on the royal robe of yellow feathers, a fathom square. Between eight and ten thousand persons passed through the palace during the morning, and foreigners as well as natives wept tears of genuine grief, while in the palace grounds the wailing knew no intermission, and many of the natives spent hours in reciting kanakaos in honour of the deceased. At midnight the king's remains were placed in a coffin. His aged father, His Highness Kanaina, who was broken-hearted for his loss, standing by. When the body was raised from the feather robe, he ordered that it should be wrapped in it, and thus be deposited in its resting place. He is the last of our race, he said. It belongs to him. The natives in attendance turned pale at this command, for the robe was the property of Ke Kao Luuhai, the dead king's mother, and had descended to her from her kingly ancestors. Averse through his life to useless parade and display, Luna Lilo left directions for a simple funeral, and that none of the old heathenish observances should ensue upon his death. So, amidst unbounded grief, he was carried to the grave with hymns and anthems, and the hopes of Hawaii were buried with him. He died without naming a successor. And thus, for the second time within fourteen months, a king came to be elected by ballot. The proceedings at the election of Luna Lilo were marked by an order, regularity and peaceableness, which reflected extreme credit on the civilization of the Hawaiians. 
but in the subsequent period the temper of the people had considerably changed, and they had been affected by influences to which some allusions were made in Letter 14. In politics, Luna Lido's views were essentially democratic, and he showed an almost undue deference to the will of the people, giving them a year's practical experience of democracy, which they will never forget. An antagonism to the foreign residents, or rather to their political influence, had grown rapidly. Some of the Americans had been unwise in their language, and the discussion on the proposed session of Pearl River increased the popular discontent and the jealousy of foreign interference in island affairs. "'America gave us the light,' said a native pastor, in a sermon which was reported over the islands. "'But now that we have the light, we should be left to use it for ourselves.'" This sentence represented the bulk of the national feeling, which, if partially unenlightened, is intensely, passionately, almost fanatically patriotic. The biennial election of delegates to the Legislative Assembly occurred shortly before Luna Lino's death, and the rallying cry, Hawaii for the Hawaiians, was used with such effect that the most respectable foreign candidates, even in the capital, had not a chance of success, and for the first time in Hawaiian constitutional history, a house was elected, consisting with one exception of natives. Immediately on the king's death, Kalakaua, who was understood to represent the foreign interest, as well as the policy indicated by the popular rallying cry, and Queen Emma came forward as candidates. The walls were placarded with addresses, mass meetings were held, canvases were busy night and day, promises impossible of fulfilment were made, and for eight days the Hawaiian capital presented those scenes of excitement, wrangling, and mutual misrepresentation which we associate with popular elections elsewhere and everywhere. The day of election came, and 39 votes were given for Kalakaua and six for Emma. On the announcement of this result, a hoarse indignant roar, mingled with cheers from the crowd without, was heard within the assembly chamber, and on the committee appointed to convey to Kalakaua the news of his election, attempting to take their seats in a carriage, they were driven back maimed and bleeding into the courthouse. The carriage was torn to pieces, and the spokes of the wheels were distributed as weapons among the rioters. The gentle children of the sun were seen under a new aspect. They became furious. The latent savagery came out, the doors of the Hall of Assembly were battered in, the windows were shattered with clubs and volleys of stones. Nine of the representatives who were known to have voted for Kalakaua were severely injured. The chairs, tables and furnishings of the room were broken up and thrown out of the windows, along with valuable public and private documents. Kerosene was demanded to fire the buildings. The police remained neutral, and conflagration and murder would have followed had not the ministers dispatched an urgent request for assistance to the United States ships of war, Portsmouth and Tuscarora, and HBM ship Tenedos, which was promptly met by the landing of such a force of sailors and marines as dispersed the rioters. Seventy arrests were made, the foreign marines held possession of the courthouse, palace and government offices, Kalakaua took the oath of office in private, the representatives with bandaged heads and arms in slings limped, and in some instances were supported to their desks to be liberated from their duties by the king in person, and in ten days the joint protectorate was withdrawn. Those who know the natives best were taken by surprise, and are compelled to recognise that a restive, half-sullen, half-defiant spirit is abroad among them, and that the task of governing them may not be the easy thing which it has been since the days of Kamehameha the Great. 
Nor do the foreign residents, especially the Americans, feel so safe as formerly, without the presence of a man of war in the harbour, since the people of Oahu have so unexpectedly developed one of the prominent arts of civilised democracy, cruel, reckless and unreasoning mobbing. Of King Kalakaua, who began his reign under such unfortunate auspices, little at present can be said. Island affairs have not settled down into their old quietude, and party spirit arising out of the election has not died out among the natives. The king chose his advisers widely, and made a concession to native feeling by appointing a native named Naheo Lelua to a seat in the cabinet as Minister of Finance, but his first arrangement was upset and a good deal of confusion has subsequently prevailed. The Queen, Kapiolani, is a Hawaiian lady of high character and extreme amiability, and both King and Queen have been exemplary in their domestic relations. Kalakaoa's first act was to proclaim his brother, Prince Leleio Hoku, his successor, investing him at the same time with the title His Royal Highness, and his second was to reorganise the military service, with the view of making it an efficient and well-disciplined force. There is something melancholy in the fact that this small Pacific kingdom has to fall back upon the old world resource of a standing army, as large in proportion to its population as that of the German Empire. Those readers who have become interested in the Sandwich Islands through the foregoing letters will join me in the earnest wish that this people, which has advanced from heathenism and barbarism to Christianity and civilization in the short space of a single generation, may enjoy peace and prosperity under King Kalakaua, that the extinction which threatens the nation may be averted, and that under a gracious divine providence, Hawaii may still remain the inheritance of the Hawaiians. End of section and end of the Hawaiian archipelago by Isabella L. Bird.